all the way from the 9th century up to around the 14th century. Just everyone. Okay, so here's our slide about the origins of Western music notation, so where it started. So the beginnings of Western music notation, it's widely considered to have begun with nomadic notation, which that was developed by Catholic monks in the 9th century in Europe. Um, and this kind of notation was developed for Gregorian chant, which is just the type of music that they would have used for the Catholic mass in all of its different parts. No. So that's yeah, not me. the first attempt at, um, you know, notating music. Um, a lot of other cultures also had their own systems of notating music. Um, notable ones are Greeks and Romans. They had their own form of music notation. Um, they used kind of like a solfege type system that they wrote out. Um, and then also in China, there was, um, they're probably one of the earliest cultures to have a, a system of music notation. They started around 400 BC, so way before all of this stuff. Um, and theirs was very, very complex. And they also had a system of um, tabs for all of their um, different kinds of stringed instruments. Um, but the reason why it started with the Catholic Church and monks is largely because monks knew how to read and write, which most people in Europe did not know how to read or write unless they were basically rich or in the church in some way or another. And um, on top of that, too, with people not being able to read and write, also books, making books was really expensive because um, in Europe during this time, they did not have paper. So everything was made out of leather, even all of the pages, not just not just the front of your books, but every single page was made from leather. And leather, of course, would be really expensive, and it takes a very, very long time to make, and it's a little bit more limited than making paper would be. Um, the Italians were the first ones in Europe to start using paper, but even then, that was not until the 13th century, and it took a long time for the rest of Europe to start picking up on using paper as well. So, um, many historians attribute the inspiration for early methods of music notation in Europe to the accentuation marks found in Greek literature. So there's those little A's I have written down there with the little dashes above, the little squiggly line. You can see in our picture over here on the side, it's just got different kinds of dashes and lines and little squiggles um, that look really similar to that Greek literature um, accent marks. So that's where most people think it probably came from because they definitely had access to that Greek literature um, in Europe during that time. Um, this kind of notation is called nooms or pneumatic notation, and it comes from the Greek word pneuma, which means a sign, so a symbol or something like that. Um, early music notation appeared as symbols placed above the text. So you can see there's all of those letters and then just those little dashes and dots and things written above it. So the dashes and dots above are telling you the contours of the melody, and then below are the words that you're singing. All of this stuff would have been written for vocal music at the time because that's what the church used. They didn't really use instruments in the church at that time. So it's all written for our voices. So they all have words that are being sung as well. Um, the markings don't indicate specific um, intervallic distances. So they don't tell you exactly how far you need to go up or down. They're just a general kind of suggestion of roughly how it looks uh, overall. Um, and then this form of notation requires that the reader already know the melody. So you can't learn a song you've never heard before from this kind of notation. You do have to kind of already know how it goes. It's more of little reminders. And um, this kind of notation just helped monks learn new music. Um, they could sit there and, and look at this music while also learning by ear. So they'd be listening to somebody and then kind of following along with all this stuff. And then once they kind of have an idea of how it goes, they can hopefully take out this music and remember because they have all these little helpful reminders of when they go up, when they go down, um, and, and what's going on with the melody. Okay, so then the next development we have, they have all these lines and dashes and all those things. Um, but like I said before, those don't really tell you the exact intervals. So they started to get a little bit more specific um, and the best way to get more specific that was with developing the staff. So by the late 10th century, they began using vertical lines. So before they're kind of just these arbitrary little dashes. Now they're using totally vertical lines um, to indicate the intervals. And if you see a shorter line, that means it's a smaller interval. And then a longer one means a larger interval. But 
even then the the length of these lines were not all the same there was no standard they weren't coming out and like taking a ruler and measuring exactly how long these lines were so you still don't know exactly you could see two short lines and one of them could mean that it's an interval of a second and another one could be a third and you wouldn't know the difference so even with this kind of notation you still have to already kind of know how the song goes um so but from there um the early version of the staff um, was developed so they started drawing these just the single horizontal line which you can see in that example that's got the red line the one on the left um, it's got those red lines going through those are just kind of showing you um, when you're kind of coming back to the same pitch so you'll have it's all of those lines are kind of centered around that one thing which gives a little a little bit more clear of an idea of how high you're going or how low you're going um, and then eventually they added more lines um, four lines became the standard notation. You can see that on the right side example. That one has four lines. Um, it looks a little funky because there's an extra line. There is technically five lines on there, but one of those lines is just the line that they're writing the text along because if you make mistakes in medieval manuscript, it's really expensive. <laughs> you don't wanna have be writing sideways and then be like, oh no, I wrote sideways on my paper and then try and cross it out or it would be a big disaster because your pages are very, very expensive. So it's not gonna go well if you're making lots of mistakes. So they have the extra line so they can keep writing straight. Um, but they use different colors too. So they use red, yellow, and black ink were the common ones that they used. Um, and it, it was sort of just a visual aid so you could see when you were on the same line, just so you didn't look at so many lines and get confused, I guess. Um, but eventually they went to how we use lines today and went with all black lines eventually. Um, I noticed too that they use four lines, but now we use five. So that was one thing that's unique about um, chant music. We usually see it with four lines instead of five. Um, and then there was usually uh, a letter written along the side of um, one or multiple of those lines, um, which is essentially the early form of our clef. So it was just telling you a certain note in the scale. Um, you can kind of see uh, on the right, side example there is a little f that's written up next to one of the red lines on there it's very tiny but on the left side there um, so the creation of the staff is usually attributed to the italian monk guido d'arezzo um, and he wrote uh, treatises about using the staff and how it was useful and he kind of popularized using the staff which is why people say that he's the he's the creator he was not necessarily the one who first ever used the staff but he's definitely the one who made it popular to use it um in europe he kind of explained why it was useful um and then he also actually developed um the medieval version of solfege that a lot of us use today a lot of singers use it um but also in a lot of countries in um, south america uh, a lot of them use the solfege um term so do re mi fa so la ti do for their note names. They don't say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or A, B, C, I think, <laughs> in Spanish, but um, they don't use those letters. They use Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, Do instead. So, yeah. Beautiful. So next we have sharing music throughout Europe. So once the staff system that Ms. Sarah just finished talking about had been developed and become widespread, the pitches of a melody could be learned without any prior knowledge of that melody. So this was a huge development in music notation because without any sort of, before all of this, you see that singers like we had discussed had to know what the melody was beforehand. Now we could actually look at a piece of music without having any prior knowledge of it and being able to sing it. So here's an example of that. <laughs> So now we can obviously see that it's getting a lot closer to our modern notation with kind of the direction that it's going so it can show you a, a general consensus of what's going on in the music. 
Um, this also meant that new music could spread farther. A piece of manuscript could travel much farther and with less trouble than a person who knows the melody. So this form of notation didn't stop the common practice of learning by ear, but music notation was still only used to an, as an aid to help learn and memorize new music. So a piece that could be not from as far as this uh, time, but a lot of people know Scarborough Fair. Are you going to Scarborough Fair? Most people learned this melody without the music. So this is kind of an example of, of one of those melodies that was learned that was never really put to music. Um, however, the ability to share music in a much larger radius and more quickly than was previously possible was a huge development. It also allowed for medieval composers to more easily observe the practices and styles of other monasteries. Oops, come back one slide. So the need for rhythmic notation. So why do we need rhythmic notation? So polyphony is what inspired the need for rhythmic notation. So polyphony is the style of simultaneously combining a number of parts, each forming an individual melody. So this is really, really important because polyphony does not mean that there's one voice with an accompaniment. That would be homophony or monophony. So Polyphony means that there's two separate lines going on at the same time, and without rhythmic notation, you're not going to be able to control which voice is going to, or the voices are going to be able to stick together. So here's an example of polyphony. <laughs> So as you can tell, there's two very distinct vocal lines without any accompaniment that need rhythmic notation or they'll go off from each other. So in the late 12th century, scholars at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris frequently used polyphony in their music and were at the forefront of its use at the time. The use of polyphony demanded more specific rhythmic notation to clearly delineate between two contrapuntal parts which is just really fancy talk. Basically, they had to be able to work together. So two monks, Elenin and Periton, are known for compiling and revising polyphonic music, adding in a new method of rhythmic notation. Elenin wrote the Magnus Liber Organi, or the Great Book of Organum, and Periton later revised and rewrote sections of the Magnus Liber Organi in the 13th century. The Magnus Liber Organi uses notation based on poetic meters. It only features two values, short and long, previs and longa. These were arranged to form six rhythmic modes known as ligatures. So you see here mode one, two, three, four, five, and six. This was the notation here in the second little box. These were the notations. This is what you would see on the music above the words. So it would be long, short, or short, long, or long, short, short, or short, 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 long, or long, long, long or short, short, short. So as you can tell, here is the modern equivalent. So we see it kind of with our quarter notes and our eighth notes or our dots. So this is just basically getting us closer and closer to modern notation. And you can also see the poetic symbols that would be above the words. So again, this is really, really important for polyphony as we get closer to modern notation because when singers started to work together, they have to know that it was less about improvisation for one singer and more about working together so that there was a, a knowledge between the two. All right, so that was sort of the beginning um, or the first attempts at specifying rhythm in music and then it got even more detailed. So um, the German music theorist Franco of Cologne, um, he suggested that individual notes should have their own value indicated by the shape of the note. So as opposed to the other one, notice that they're all in those kind of patterns and they're limited by those patterns. So the notes sort of only exist in those little groupings of threes um, and the individual notes don't necessarily mean a specific amount of time, but now they wanted to make it so that one note could mean a specific amount of time. Um, and then he also created the formal de definition of a rest. So he acknowledged that rest rest exists and that the silence in music is important. Um, so Franco wrote the treatise Ars Cantus Mensurabilis, um, which means the, the art of the measurable song. Um, so he wrote that between uh, 1260 and 1280. 
and his system had the long, the brev, and the semi-brev. So as opposed to just the short and long, he had three different kinds of notes. Um, and then he also considered rest to be of equal rhythmic importance to the pitch notes as well, like I was just saying. So notes no longer re relied on their, their context to convey their length, unlike um, the ones we just talked about with modes and ligatures, where it, the pattern determined how long those notes were. So in Franco's system, um, longs and brevs could only be divided into three parts. So meter was always in ternary form, meaning that it just it was always divided into three, just like we saw in that last one too. That it was always divided in three. Um, so no part of the rhythm was ever divided into two, and the reason being for that was it's a Catholic thing where three is considered the the perfect um, number has to do with you know with your holy trinity. That's a Catholic thing, right? And the, the three is the perfect number and two would be terrible because two doesn't follow that beautiful three. They just always wanted that three to be in everything. And it was a little bit of like, I guess sort of a superstition of the church at the time where if something wasn't divided in three, then it was no good. So, um, and then although the notes had their own individual value, the ternary form, so the always being divided into three, um, still limited the power. Possibility. So it was still kind of limited like the last version too, where you could only, there were only so many options. You couldn't do whatever rhythm you wanted. It had to be divided a certain way. So then from uh, Franco's system, we have the music theorist um, Philippe de Vitry, and he wrote the Ars Nova Trius in 1322. And he then took Franco's system and changed it even more. So the biggest changes that he added were um, the develop the, the development, development of mensuration and the minimum. So the minimum is the medieval equivalent of an eighth note. So it was one smaller than their um, semi-brev. And um, mensurations, the other aspect that he changed, um, they could be combined to produce metrical grouping. So essentially just meaning um, time signatures. Um, and these are kind of the beginning of having simple versus compound meter. So having like three, four, or having six, eight being compound meter. Um, so duple divisions became more accepted during the Ars Nova period. So that's the superstition about the two being terrible, kind of calmed down a little bit, and they're more okay with the possibility of there being twos and threes. Um, and uh, the Ars Nova period is actually named after um, his treatise. So um, part of Philip de Vitry's system was the tempus. Tempus means the division of the brev, so of the really long, of one of the longer ones, the, the one smaller than the long, oh my goodness, okay. And then um, the prolation, which is the division of the semi-brev, and the modus, which is the division of the long. Um, in our little um, chart here, we have all that drawn out. So the tempus could be either perfect, which meant divided into three, or imperfect, which would be divided into two. So that goes along with that whole superstition. It's perfect if it's three, it's imperfect, no good, if it's two. Um, and then the prolation could be either major, which has nothing to do with what we think of as being major and minor today, but major just meant three, minor meant two. So same thing. Um, so if you look at the little chart there, you can see, um, so if we look at our tempus, the first um, column, it says perfectum, so perfect, meaning divided into three. So if we kind of scroll over and look at the minims column, you can see that there are three big sections. All of those little three notes are divided into three big sections. And then from the prolation, if we go back over to the prolation, it says major. So that also means three. So our three big sections are divided into three groups too. So three, three, and three. That's perfect major. And then the symbol they would use for that would be a full circle is the tempus. And then the dot in the middle means major prolation. Um, if we go to a different one, we can look at the one, uh, maybe the third row down. We have tempus is imperfect, so it's a half circle. And it's two big groupings, so only two big groupings. And then the prolation is major, so it gets three, and it's denoted by that dot. So we have two big groupings of three. So we have three, three, but only two sets of threes. If that makes any sense. <laughs> it's, very, it's a very complicated way of thinking of it, but it really just means six, eight. That's all it is. <laughs> it's just a different way of notating it, but it's all the same information that we use now.
And now we've arrived at modern notation. So as you can see, this is what we're used to seeing now. Well, I mean, as modern notation, this is handle, but you know what we mean. So the Ars Nova form of music notation uh, from the 14th century spread throughout Europe over the next three centuries. Details like clefs and void versus black note heads and stems underwent various cosmetic changes over the centuries. Additionally, the use of bar lines and measures became popular. So you start to see bar lines come in, which again, like Ms. Sarah was talking about earlier, then we start to be, see like the 6-8 at the beginning of the bar or the 3-4 or the 2-4, the et cetera. So though music notation of this period looks different from modern notation, most of the same information was still able to be conveyed. By the late 18th century, Renaissance composers popularizing notating dynamics, popularized notating dynamics, ties, slurs, and articulations like accents, staccato, and tenuto. As instrumental music became more popular among scholars, the need for more practical music markings increased. Composers were writing for a variety of instruments rather than writing for the strictly the vocal music of the medieval period. So if you've noticed throughout this entire um, classes, we only talked about voice because that's really only what was going on. It was, it was the voice that was used in the Catholic church or in some sort of religious ceremony. And there wasn't really notation for instruments. A lot of the notation, there wasn't notation, but that didn't mean that it didn't exist. It was just a lot more improvisory. So we start to see now in modern notation that everything is written down, that even if there is improvisation, like da capo in, in Baroque, and in Baroque you see it. <laughs> That's never happened before. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Back to what I was saying. Okay. So what you see in the Baroque period with the capo is you actually start to see these, these um, improvisations are actually written down. Whereas in, in instrumental music before modern notation, it wasn't written down. So this is really what we start to see to get towards the modern notation. And we see instruments start to really take a big uh, place in music. So that's uh, modern notation basically in a nutshell. Of course, we could go on for probably six weeks to go on about this, yeah. but that is our modern notation. Yeah. Anything from you, Miss Sarah? Oh, one, one little interesting thing was um, back on a, an earlier slide too, um, one of our musical examples, if you noticed, if you looked at the composer, it said, oh, I can't wish I could, oh, I think it was Saint, Saint Marshall, um, yes, Saint Marshall in France, the Abbey of Saint Marshall in France. That was a little interesting kind of thing too about um, this time period is that um, sometimes music was signed by a specific composer, we knew exactly who it was that that wrote the music, but a lot of times it wasn't. Um, and it was sort of just like the property of the church, property of the, the monastery. So, and, and style, um, compositional styles was very much divided by what church you were from. Um, that's why we were like on this slide too, they're talking about um, uh, Notre Dame, what we were talking about there, and they had a very specific style. So that was just a little interesting thing that all the monasteries kind of had their own style and they kind of owned the music kind of own the monks who wrote the music. They belong to the church and they, which is very, very much a Catholic thing that you, you belong to the church and you're serving the church and it's not all about just you individually as the composer. So that's an interesting thing. Sometimes they're signed by the church rather than a specific person. Yeah, it, it is really interesting that also that this is so connected to the Catholic church. And as we know from our history classes and from music history that that's where it started because the Catholic church had the money, they ran things. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to delineate or to, to take apart modern or music notation away from the Catholic Church, which is why it's so focused on that and why you see the use of saints and other things. But that is notation. So we hope you enjoyed this class. If you have any questions, please let us know because I'm sure that there's plenty. Could you go back to the penultimate slide, the one before this, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one is a mouthful. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I'm actually snapping a picture of it. Gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this one's a lot. Great, got it. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. 
So if that is all, we hope you enjoyed the class. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to reach out to us and then we will see you next week. Thank you. That was really great. All right. Thank you. Bye.